At Fast Ad Shipping, we take your safety seriously. It's one of the many reasons why we've remained one of the world's foremost providers of quality offshore service vessels ever since our very first vessel was contracted for use in November of 1959. My name is Kerry McIntosh and I'm the master on the Farsitella. Okay, I'm Sam Frogley, I'm the chief officer on board the Farsitella. My name is Peter Burnham and I'm the chief engineer. From the beginning, Fastad has been committed to the idea that a successful organisation is one that always looks for ways to improve in every capacity. This drive for improvement is both a personal and a collective responsibility. And the greatest resource we have for improvement is our staff, you. Safety is our number one priority. Um, we, we want everyone to, to look after each other. We want to do everything that we can to make sure everyone goes home safe, we still get the job done. We are in a position of working in an industry that is certainly uh, out there um, at the higher levels of, um, of possible incidents and um, I think Fastead and, and certainly the crew are very much focused on, on going home to their loved ones and family. Whenever risk factors are present, risk assessment is a vital and potentially life-saving procedure. In this video, you'll watch a real-life OSV crew aboard the Far Sitella as they set out to perform a job fraught with its own set of unique challenges and risks. Tank entry. Okay, okay thanks, man. Okay, timing. Okay, we're good to go. Good to go. All right. Watching this procedure, you'll get to know the ins and outs of our risk assessment protocols and behaviour-based safety procedures and understand how to follow FASTAD policy to ensure a safe workplace for you and your fellow crew. We'll be covering daily work scope meeting, job hazard analysis, or JHA, permit to work, isolation tagging, PPE, toolbox meetings, step back five by five, task observation, after task review, and finally, incident reports, near miss reports, investigation and classification. Before we get started, always remember, when you're aboard a fast ad vessel, your safety and the safety of others is our primary concern. Within fast ad, we reinforce that everybody on board is empowered to stop the job if they're not happy or they feel that an operation is unsafe. And this is from the, f the, the lowest trainee on board, day one trainee, right through to the most experienced master. The tank's been tested at the top and at the, uh, the lower mid level. Yeah. Remember, uh, if you see something that could cause a potentially hazardous situation, speak up. Your right to stop work if there is a genuine safety issue at hand is always respected and the work will not begin again until the safety issue has been resolved. It's our policy. And I'm convinced that people do know they have that tool and uh, that they will use it. Ultimately, um, because we're going in there, we're obviously um, inspecting it. There'll be a tank inspection report. Every day, a minimum of three workplace meetings will occur. First, at the daily work scope meeting, the master, chief officer and chief engineer convene to discuss the work schedule for the day. The beginning of the process is, is when there's a job identified that's required to be done on board, usually through our STARS system, uh, the STARS planned maintenance system. Occasionally, it'll be a, uh, a job that's not planned. Today's task involves a tank entry scenario. Well certainly initial planning stages are important. The areas of division then would be that we would certainly um, get together a team. So we need to plan the work scope that if, if we have the right time frame to do that job um, in a safe and effective manner and then uh, from there we will um, roughly work out between the three of us who will be involved in this. After this meeting, the Chief Officer and Chief Engineer will then lead meetings of their own with their respective departments, explaining the scope of work to be done and its expected outcome. The Chief Engineer will discuss the operations and maintenance schedule. 
the seat if you could. So we would have a, a PMS or a planned maintenance system for uh, identifying those tanks that would be coming up within the, within the schedule. Before we actually start the, the permit to work and the job, we need to decide firstly if it's required to be done, when it's required to be done, if we have the time to do it, the operational schedule of the vessel, um, if we need to organise a maintenance day, or if we're on location we need to touch base with the, with the offshore installation and let them know that there may be where we'll be out of action for a couple of hours. Prior to performing any tasks, Fastad requires its employees to review a job hazard analysis, or JHA, which is used to assess the safety hazards of a job, as well as the appropriate controls used to mitigate threats to people, property or the environment. JHA, job hazard analysis, involves, involves identifying through the, the procedures, through the certain steps that the job is required to go through, to identify the hazards that are associated with each task and each step, the control measures that we put in place to alleviate those hazards. Fastad's Safety and Environment Employee Manual breaks down all the scenarios when it's necessary to review or develop JHAs. Is there an existing generic procedure, shipboard procedure or JHA which identifies and controls the hazards of the job? In this case, the answer is yes. A job hazard analysis for tank entry can be found in the JHA register. That means that all JHAs have to be originated from one place being the bridge. And they can be specific to our ship. In other words, the task may well be a simple task, but um, given that uh, we have various ships in the fleet, it, it may well be a specific um, uh, JHA for that ship. Um, we have generic ones as well, which give us certainly a, a, a good guideline as to how to develop uh, and manipulate uh, and, and achieve a, a good JHA outcome. All personnel involved in the procedure will review this JHA during preparation meetings, which outlines the task, the personnel involved, the different hazards in each step of the process, the severity of the risk, and the control measures used to lessen the risk. Um, but what if no JHA exists sure for the task at hand? Crew must then assess whether it involves an appreciable risk. Welcome to the onboard risk assessment process. It's a piece of paper. We, uh, we follow the FASTAD form. They give us a form as a guideline off DocMap. So we use that as a guideline and then we, we create the, the uh, JHA um, in, along those lines. When performing a risk assessment for any potentially dangerous procedure, crew will be assigned to three clearly defined roles, independent of position on board. A risk approver, a risk assessor and an executor. So what kinds of potentially dangerous procedures may require a risk evaluation? Both planned and unplanned maintenance, as well as routine and non-routine tasks. Risk assessment follows a five-step process. First, the risk approver will determine if there is a need for risk management for the task at hand. If so, the risk assessor will step in and identify the hazards in place, along with potential control procedures, according to FASTAD's hierarchy of controls. Eliminating the hazard, substituting the hazardous substance or practice with a less hazardous one, engineering controls to isolate the hazard, administrative controls to reduce the hazard, and lastly, personal protective equipment, the last line of defence. Within FASTAD we like to use the hierarchy of controls and use that as our lowest level of, uh, of safety. Through the JHA process, we review the PPE that's, that's suggested and we decide if that's appropriate. Do we need a higher level? or will in fact that PPE encumber what we're trying to do. The risk assessor will then gather all the necessary information, breaking down the steps of the job and then calling a risk assessment meeting. All departments and parties involved should be present at the risk assessment meeting, during which an overview of the job and its hazards will be conducted and a risk assessment form will be documented and signed. The risk approver is then responsible for determining if the level of risk is acceptable. If it remains in the red, 
the job shall not continue until the level of risk has been reduced. Finally, it's time for the implementation of the various control measures and the delegation of responsibility via the executor, ensuring that all parties have a common understanding of their tasks. The executor is responsible for making sure that all control measures are in place before the work commences. After the five-step risk assessment is complete, the crew will be observed performing the process and a job hazard analysis may now be completed. The permit to work is, is maintained on one computer on the ship which controls people's access to it so no uncontrolled permits can be issued and they all have to run through the bridge. To help manage risks while on the job, Fastad has implemented a permit to work system, or PTW, that requires authorisation before any dangerous task can be completed. Tasks that require a permit to work before commencement include welding and hot work, working at heights, electrical or machinery work, and confined space entry or tank entry. The work to be carried out, today we're doing a tank inspection and we select the type of permit being hot work, electrical machinery, working at heights or entry into tank or confined space. So this tells us that the permit has been generated and already saved within the system and once we OK that, we have our permit to work. The top section is filled in with the information that I just entered into it. You'll find the applicable permit to work on the bridge's IMS from where it can be printed. The PTW must be signed by the duty deck officer and the chief engineer and all relevant personnel must be issued a permit to work before they may participate in any task. It slows the whole process down instead of just bolting straight into the job. Everybody's aware a permit to work has to be done. Personnel participating in confined space entry and working at heights are required to undergo a specific training program before they may be granted a permit to work. Remember, even if the work is to be completed by a contractor, a FASTAD permit to work is nevertheless required whenever FASTAD is the supervising party. It's still evolving, it's, it's always under constant review, but permit to work um, plays a very key part in keeping us safe and certainly the, um, the asset that we're in charge of um, at, at, a, at a key level of performance. In the early days it was just about getting the job done and, and basically worrying about uh, other issues as they, uh, as they unfolded and certainly now it's quite the reverse. Before engaging in a dangerous activity, such as tank entry, isolation tags are an important part of the risk management process. One step of the permit to work system is to tag out or lock out any mechanical systems or any electrical systems. And by tagging something out, it means that uh, that piece of machinery can't inadvertently be operated because there is an open permit on it. Various equipment can cause injury, damage or a pollution incident through its use during shipboard tasks. Isolation tags can help guide crew through these tasks and mitigate the incident of human error. There are two kinds of isolation tags, out-of-service tags and danger tags. Out-of-service tags are used to notify crew that a piece of equipment requires maintenance before next use. Danger tags, meanwhile, are used for protection of personnel while working on a specific task. For example, in a tank, uh, tag a pump out or even isolate it so that if someone is a ta in a tank, there's no possibility of a product being pumped into that tank. Before tank entry, all necessary valves and pumps should be isolated to ensure crew safety. We don't want those pieces of pumps or valve systems to actually open. Um, so there would be a process there for locking out a pump system, uh, double isolation for a person that's entering a tank, that we would actually have two valves um, 
uh, the first two leading into those tanks would be isolated and they would include things like the automation system that we would stop, we could isolate the valve and in addition to that we can remove the, um, the actual interlocks to, uh, to open that valve. So in effect we can isolate parts thereof or, or the whole system as a, as, a, as a total unit. As is stated on the tag, danger tags can only be removed by the signed person. Out of service tags may be removed by authorised personnel, provided the person who originally issued the tag is absent. The personal protective equipment that you've been issued is an important measure for protecting yourself against on-the-job hazards before engaging in any task. Review the JHA to find out what PPE will be required when performing the work at hand. Through the JHA, uh, the, the risks are calculated and, uh, and we decide what PPE is appropriate. The PPE required for each task on board is again used in line with FastAd's PPE matrix, which gives us a guideline as to what we should be wearing for each individual task on board the ship. When you join a vessel, you will be issued overalls, hard hat, glasses and safety boots. And when you come on board, you will be familiarised with all the additional PPE available to you. Several different types of PPE can be utilised to mitigate risk, including gloves. It's recommended we, we have gloves on board for all operations. There are some cases where gloves will actually hinder what you're trying to do eye protection, including goggles, face shields and welding masks, safety harnesses, life vests, life jackets and other flotation devices, respiratory protection, including respirators, breathing apparatuses and personal gas monitors. I'd like to take the lids off so we can take some air samples yep. um, and establish the atmospherics for the tank entry. In addition to the three meetings that take place at the beginning of each day, toolbox meetings will be held before each task commences. Before we start doing the job, we will get a toolbox which involves everyone in there who's going to be hands-on on the job. During a toolbox meeting, you'll want to discuss any or all of the following the work scope, the expected outcome of the job, and all crew assignments. You should review, if necessary, identified hazards, the JHA for the task, and any necessary equipment or areas that have been isolated with applicable isolation tags. The toolbox doesn't require an officer or, or an engineer to be involved in it. It can be just the guys doing it, and, and that keeps it as an informal safety tool, it makes it easy for the guys to use and accept that they're, they're being included in the, in the toolbox and in the safety process on board. Keep in mind, once a permit to work has been issued, an important series of conditions must be met before the job can proceed. Being a confined space, um, it's, it's obviously an area of great hazard. We would pull out the JHA, go through the process of identifying what PPE equipment that we need to do. Uh, identifying those hazards, identifying the products and, and, and certainly the, um, the equipment that we would be using, rescue equipment, gas analysing equipment and the various checklists that we, we've developed for that. The tank entry checklist. Before any work can begin, it is necessary to rig any approved portable lighting and ventilation apparatus. In some cases, uh, tanks that uh, have been pre-designed for ventilation, we would actually have maybe a day or so require us to actually ventilate that tank space. Rescue and resuscitation equipment must also be rigged and ready in vicinity of enclosed spaces. The rescue equipment obviously from the point of view that uh, remains outside the tank, um, both in the sense of um, rescue harnesses, additional uh, BA equipment that uh, are, are ready and available for, for donning. Before any confined space entry can proceed, a gas test is required to ensure that sufficient oxygen levels of between 19 to 23% are present. Yeah, you're at 21%.
and that any flammable gases present are below their lower explosive limit. That's the minimum ratio of gas in any space required for it to become flammable. I'll go and get the duty deck officer to sign, and the chief engineer. We've got to do three copies, one to the bridge, one to the control room, one to the work site. The supervisor must ensure that the confined space entry checklist has been completed. You will then inform the duty deck officer and ensure that the safety watch is in attendance before the job begins. If for some reason we, we have some, uh, some personnel change out throughout the job because of the watches that they're on, is we'll stop the job and have another toolbox and again bring everyone back up to speed with their tasks, their obligations and the procedures for what we're going to be doing. That happens quite a lot. We plan for a job, um, but for op other operational reasons we don't get the time to do it, so it's postponed. And if we start up again the following day, uh, we go through the process again of discussing it. So what I would like done now is um, we have an isolation register system over here, which we've all worked on before. It's so important that uh, you work as a, as a unit, as a team, um, with 14 people on board. Um, things happen um, quite quickly and, and if we can preempt and pre-design our, our day and understand and reflect on what we did yesterday, I think that certainly does help enormously. With that, we're almost ready to go. There's just one more step. But it is a critical last minute measure that can often be the difference between a smooth procedure and an unfortunate incident. It's what we call the step back five by five. A lot of companies have different uh, keywords or buzzwords. Fastad uh, took the step back five by five. Five by five. Take five steps back and think for five minutes before you begin a task. Engage your mind before your hands. Step back, stop the job, have a think about what's actually going on. If you've come across a problem, take the time to think about it, maybe talk about it, uh, maybe discuss other ways to, to do the job and solve any problems before you actually go, go back into the job. Remember, if you notice any potential hazards during the step back five by five, it is your responsibility and your right to stop work until the matter is addressed. It really is effective because, again, it, it just empowers people to, to, hey, let's just have a toolbox, let's just stop, hang on, something may have changed, I'm not up to speed with what's going on, we can all just reassess how we're going to uh, approach this. During step back five by five, you'll want to pay attention to hazards in and around the workspace, the equipment you're using for the job, making sure it's fit for the purpose and in good working order. Do we have the right tools? Do we have the right safety equipment to, uh, to safely perform the tasks at hand? The job method itself, walking through the process step by step and thinking about anything and everything that could possibly go wrong. Saying, well, hang on a moment, this is not quite right as discussed, as planned, and let's stop now and then reevaluate. What if circumstances change during the job? Think about the effects that changing weather conditions, a person or persons leaving the job, or malfunctioning equipment or tools could have. Expect the unexpected. And I think using that step back five by five is just such a key area to, uh, to understanding and saying, look, you know, it may well be fine yesterday, but today we've got something different. Finally, Think about similar past jobs you've done and apply what you've learned to the step back 5x5 five five process. Always look for ways to improve. There's constantly a, always a better way to do things. The safe completion of dangerous tasks, such as tank entry, is of the highest importance to us at Fastad. To this end, we've created and developed several task observation processes, which can help identify hazards as they occur. Task observation forms a critical part of our best safety practices at Fastad. On board the Fast Teller, we divide the, the, the ship's complement into three teams, 
and they will take a section of the ship each week, go through it, and we've now incorporated the weekly rounds, the weekly safety rounds, and the hazard rounds together. Each crew member will be required to perform task observation once every week. We have a, a system of safety uh, hazard rounds rosters where we're rotating people through not only the engine room but also various um, other areas on the ships. Every ship carries a hazard identification log aboard, which can be used to anonymously document any and all hazards witnessed. The hazard log on board this ship is open to anybody on board to put, incident, uh, to put hazards in when they occur uh, to, to stop them happening again. And it also is through the close out of those hazards in the hazard log means that when a hazard is identified it needs to be actioned upon. If it's not actioned upon we'll see that it's still there and we need to manage that hazard. It's preventative in its nature so we're out looking for hazards so that they don't become an incident at a later time. This is a safety observation card, the newest task observation process aboard our fleet. It's been introduced for two explicit purposes, to praise crew when safe work practices are upheld and to identify areas where improvement may be necessary. FastAd's safety observation card system is a new tool that we have for primarily behavioural based safety. We all know that, um, that, the, the, that we see things happening all the time and it's good that we can, can use these safety observation cards where appropriate to, um, to let the people know that they're doing the right thing or where there is room for improvement. You will assess what you observe as either positive or needing improvement, including behaviour and attitude, procedure, tools, housekeeping, body posture and exposure, communication, task planning and PPE. Feedback can be reported from the observer directly to the person or persons being observed, allowing for discussion of best safety practices. It's open to everybody on board and it's encouraged that uh, everyone on board does use it. There are no names, again, like most safety incident reporting systems. There are no names and the, the office, when they do review these, uh, they know, they understand the situations, but they are not aware of who, who is involved. And that does encourage uh, when we do have improvement opportunities for it to be taken in a confidential manner. Remember, the feedback should be constructive and should identify both operational excellence and improvement opportunities. It can be a polite way to say, hey guys, we've noticed this, we'd like to improve on it, rather than going straight to the next step. Regular task feedback is critical for ensuring we are heading in the right direction as an organisation. It's the sharing of knowledge on fast ad vessels that, uh, that teaches everybody uh, and brings up everybody's standards of seamanship on board. Once you have filled out a safety observation card or completed a task observation, the information must be entered into our system or, in place of this, given to the duty deck officer to ensure later entry. Certainly the people that are involved in that job some of them are quite um, uh, thinkers outside the square and they've identified key areas that could be improving, both on equipment that we may well be using, processes that we may well have undertaken. And um, that is very much um, a key area to, to change and to, and to review that process. All FastAd vessels are supplied with the FastSoc software package, as well as Vessel Manager. Both of these modules can be used to record task observations. The Vessel Manager's observation module then takes this data and provides real-time data trends for company and crew. You will see the three most commonly recurring positive observations, as well as the three most common needs for improvement. Trend analysis allows us as an organisation to strive for excellence. 
the common trends where room for improvement exists are analysed on a continuous basis and provided in the Health, Safety, Environmental and Quality Report, or HSEQ, on a monthly basis. These reports form the basis of action plans and vessel-wide initiatives. It can get shared around both the shore and, and, uh, and other ships of this particular class so that they're not making the same mistakes. Then we learn by those, those, those mistakes and we improve on, on what we actually do. Without exception, all incidents are to be reported as soon as possible to the officer of the watch and the company, including near misses. A near miss is, um, is where something that could have, could have been an incident, but I guess we could just say we're lucky it wasn't. We're lucky it was caught in time. We're lucky there was, uh, there was one final safety measure that was still in place. Um, to stop a, an incident occurring. But because an incident could have occurred and that uh, ensures that the key people, the ship manager and, and ultimately the client are kept in the loop about what's going on. A, a near miss um, is, is done through FastAds incident reporting system through STARS on the, on the STARS system through the computer. Most ships contain the STARS incident reporting system that will be used. If this is not available, a hard copy of an incident reporting form will need to be filed. FastAds incident reporting system is, uh, is very transparent um, and items that are discovered that are going to be of value throughout the fleet are sent back to the fleet through, um, through safety flashes, through fleet memos. It's there to help the people uh, improve, um, improve procedures, systems, and it also can uh, help people on other vessels uh, at times when it's broadcast throughout the fleet. And it might just uh, get someone alerted to a similar situation on their vessels. Remember that FastAd encourages a no-blame culture when reporting incidents and near misses. I think it's not only a learning tool, but I think as, as FastAd values point out, and certainly our clients, that there is an openness and transparency and we can use that um, incident reporting and near miss to improve the next time that we do something. When filing a report, it must be signed by the ship's master, a HSEQ department representative, and any injured or responsible parties. Even if an incident does not result in an injury, equipment damage or pollution, an incident report must still be filed. The company's incident reporting and investigating procedure, which can be found aboard every vessel, includes a checklist to ensure that all necessary actions are completed and that the incident reports are properly classified. What happens to these reports the company relies on incident reports to create a safe, friendly and pollution-free work environment. All incident reports are copied for review by the HSEQ department and the ship manager. This information is then translated into appropriate strategies and initiatives to lessen the occurrence of these incidents. In this program, we learnt about the daily work scope meetings and how this conversation sets the tone and expectations for crew involvement for the day, job hazard analysis, or JHA, and how the safety of a particular task is assessed and work is planned. The permit to work process for confined space entry, isolation tagging, or lockout tag out to ensure safety, not only for repair engineers, but those crew who might inadvertently try to operate equipment under repair. The personal protective equipment issued to each crew member. Toolbox meetings. Step back five by five, and how thinking through a task before performing adds an additional margin of safety. Task observation. 
and how observing others reinforces identification of hazards and poor adherence to safety procedures. And then the after-task review, where these observations and suggestions are discussed. And finally, incident reports, near-miss reports, investigation and classification where we close the loop with key personnel to let them know about accidents and near accidents, which will lead to safer procedures and practices in the future. Remember, anyone involved in a potentially hazardous task has the authority to stop the job if he or she feels that there is a danger to themselves, fellow crew members or equipment and property. Safety is serious business at Fastad and we're constantly improving our processes to remain a successful and safe organisation. You happy if I head down, Sam? <laughs>